Wine Wednesday, everyone. I am Jessica Bell from My Wine School, where we make wine your way. And I've got my wingman, Skip, in the room with me. Everyone say howdy, Skip. Hi, everybody. Skip says hello. So we have made it to Winecast number two. We made it. And definitely learned a lot from the first Winecast. Uh, the first being that, um, and it actually has nothing to do with wine, what we learned, well, at least what I learned. The first thing that I learned is I have to press record. So any of you who came and watched the wine cast after it was recorded, or rather not recorded, so watched it the next day, um, you may notice that we jumped in five minutes late. That's because about five minutes in, I realized I hadn't pressed record yet. So that was one thing we learned. Also, I was so excited to see all of the chatter going on. And if you're new today, if you look to your right, you'll see a place where people are going to hopefully chat in. So if anyone's out there, if you want to say hello, we'd love to hear you guys, uh, hear your, your, your virtual voices, typing voices. So if you're out there, say hello. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about how to get involved in later winecasts at the end of this uh, winecast. So hey, BG Dub, and um, I know it's Brian O'Keefe. Um, hi guys, how are ya? Good to see you tonight. So last week, I expected about three of the planted people in the audience, the three people I planted in the audience to be the only people talking last week. And I was overjoyed when we had, we had a full chat roll going on. So it was, for the first one, it was a little much for me and I couldn't take it all in. And so afterwards, I went back and I read through the chat roll. And a couple of things uh, I was just thrilled with. The first was I saw the beginnings of a community. And what I loved is that people were asking questions and other people on the uh, chat roll were actually answering the questions as well. And that just made me so happy because I want this to be more of a conversation than say a lecture. So I was really excited to see that. Another thing I saw is that I didn't get to everyone's questions. And so what I decided to do this time, and we'll see if it works, is that any questions I don't get to tonight, if you actually, if you're on the homepage right now, the My Wine School homepage, you can scroll down. Don't worry, you won't lose me and I won't go anywhere. But you can scroll down just a little bit and on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see MWS Decants. And right under that, I've already set up a space for all the unanswered questions. It says October 12th, I think it says wine questions. Is that what it says, Skip? Wine questions? Uh, where are we? I put them on the spot. <laughs> um, so it says wine questions. And so anything that we don't answer tonight, hopefully by tomorrow morning, I'll have that set up for you with all the questions that we didn't get to. Also, if anyone is here uh, through my WSET course, which is um, an accreditation course that we offer, they all, um, I think you guys often want to be writing a full tasting note. And in the interest of time and to keep everything relevant and interesting, we're trying to keep it now under 30 minutes. Last week, 20 minutes was a little tough, so we're going to aim for 30 uh, this week. But that tasting note, or actually my tasting note, in the W set format will also be there. So if we don't cover anything on this tasting, you can check in tomorrow morning and compare your tasting note. It'll give you some time to write your own tasting note as well. So um, I see Susan's already into the Malbec. I, uh, I like that. Way to go, Susan. Get started early. In fact, can I tell you guys, I had, um, I had we had our first wine cast last week, and uh, my mom and dad are actually um, across the country, but they happened to make it to a computer. This is the beautiful thing about what we're doing. You can watch this at any time, any place you want. And she called me that night, and she had one suggestion for me, one suggestion. And it was that I need to tell people to start drinking earlier. So now you can see how and why I have made a career out of drinking wine. Okay, it, it runs in my blood. I can't help it. Um, I love you, Mom, and I appreciate the comments. So everyone, start drinking if you have wine so I don't get scolded uh, next time my mom calls and, and to give me some, some feedback. So go ahead and get that, uh, those bottles started. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to give you guys a couple tips on how to optimize your viewing experience if this happens to be your first wine cast. So in the bottom right-hand corner down here, we've got a black rectangle. If you uh, want to blow up the screen, not, well, not blow up like a bomb, but <laughs> enlarge. Skip's over there um, trying to prompt me with the correct word, enlarge. So enlarge the screen. Um, you can press that, so I'm not, uh, you know, tiny. 
Um, and then the other thing next to that, it's uh, like somewhere around here, is a uh, circular uh, arrow. And that is your first place to go for any troubleshooting. So let's say your screen is jumping, there's a lag, my lips aren't going with the sound. Just press that and it'll reset the connection for you and hopefully um, improve your viewing experience. If you should have any other problems that can't be solved by refreshing, let us know because we really want to make sure that we get uh, the best uh, viewing experience for you. So, let's see. Today, for Winecast 2, we are doing crowd pleasers. So what is a crowd pleaser? Well, another word for a crowd pleaser is a uh, patio pounder. People love to say patio pounders. And it's just, the idea is that they go down simple. So um, we're gonna be using the Desero Malbec from Mendoza, Argentina to illustrate um, concepts that I think you can start to look for in wines that may or may not be crowd pleasers. So let's take a look at this wine. This is the label, nice and blown up for you. And the name of the wine is Desero. Now it's a really good thing that I have um, really good Spanish speaking skills so I can translate that for you because I know that's tough. De cero, it actually means from zero. So I know that, yeah, that um, I didn't help too much on that one. But from zero, what they're trying to say, everything comes from scratch. It's a very labor intensive wine. But there's another word on there that might actually be a little bit more difficult to translate and it's under de cero, it's under our great Malbec and it's remolinos. So the remolinos uh, and actually what a Remolinos is, oh, it's a whirlwind. We've just been transported to the middle of Mendoza, Argentina. This is actually not a random whirlwind. This is a whirlwind at the vineyard of De Cero. And so why is this so important? A apart from the visual effect of, uh, of this, this is important because in Mendoza, it's, it's, a, it's a, not a warm, it's a hot climate. Last week for the Gruet, we talked about wine being produced between the 30 and 50 degree north and south latitude lines. The closer you are to 30, the closer you are to the equator, and so the hotter it is. Well, Mendoza is right around 32 degrees, so it is hot. It's hot in Mendoza. So when you have a hot climate, often what quality wine producers will look for are things that create a cooler, what we call macro climate, so a, a, a smaller climate within the large climate, um, and they'll look for different uh, things that'll help that happen. So one thing here are the remolinos. They tend to blow during vintage time and they help cool down the vineyards. Also something that this particular producer has going on is you can see all those mountains in the background. Those are the Andes. And this particular producer is planted at 3,500 feet. So that's really high. Not as high as our Gure last week, which um, if anyone remembers, go ahead and chat it in. I, I, that's a hard question, so if you don't get it, don't worry. But um, it was 3,500 feet for Desero, and uh, Gure was just a little bit high. Wow, BG Dub, you were studying. Oh my goodness, or you're just, you're just uh, amazing. You're right, BG Dub. It's 4,200 um, feet in the air for the uh, Gure from last week. Fantastic, wow. Okay, so, so, um, that uh, um, will actually bring us to our first wine interactive question, or what we'll call our wine IQs. So the first wine IQ that we'll do will hopefully be a gimme. I just gave you the answers to this. But what does not help keep the vineyards cool at Desero? So what doesn't help? So go ahead and, and uh, let us know what you think. Um, while you're doing that, let me just say, this particular producer I really like. Um, this is only their fourth vintage, and um, the, I just think uh, in the previous vintages we've seen some fantastic wines. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of this producer. Uh, and, and the reason is because our, in Argentina, Malbecs tend to be really, really ripe because it's so hot, but this is one Malbec that I tend to see more balance in my Malbecs, which is, which is quite uh, refreshing. So, uh, good job. I, I see some people uh, saying that C, large expensive fans. And you guys are right, okay? And that, I know that sounds, oh, like she's unsuccessfully trying to be funny. Large expensive fans, please. But can I just tell you something? That that is not as crazy as it sounds. There are actually vineyard owners who use large expensive fans. Not to keep vineyards cool, but actually to battle things like frost and rot. So I'm not totally out of left field on that one. In fact, probably the largest, most expensive fan is a helicopter. Vineyard owners or managers will actually use helicopters. These are for our really good wines, and you'll pay for it 
and the price of the bottle, but they will do anything it takes to keep their grapes uh, where they want them. So I'm not, I'm not too crazy, just a little. Uh, okay, so let's see. So um, what we wanna do next is, actually, you know what? Um, I'd love to know if anyone out there has any patio pounders that they enjoy. So crowd pleasers, what makes a crowd pleaser so pleasing to the crowd? Well, they, um, they, they tend to go down easy um, and they're just, uh, when, you, when you offer them to people, more than the average number of people like it. So a lot of people tend to like it. So if you have any uh, crowd pleasers, so I see BG Dub has um, like Sancerre. Are there any others, Skip, that you see? Uh, sorry to tell you this, but Miller Lite is good. Miller Lite! Not, not by me. Not by you. Okay, Skip says not by him, but Miller Lite is a patio pounder. Yeah, definitely. And that is a great point, actually. I like it. Because Miller Lite, now, it might not be the highest quality beer. Now, my husband would kill me for saying that, because that's his, one of his favorite, if not favorite. Um, but uh, what's a great point about that is that patio pounders and crowd pleasers don't have to be high in quality. They just have to be likable. So definitely, yeah, I mean, what's better than drinking a Miller Lite, a cold Miller Lite with a hot dog at a burger game? Well, what's better than that? Well, it's when they win that game, okay? So, um, but Rosé's definitely, and uh, Terry K, which Susan, you're ahead of the game. Susan said Terry K. Uh, that's the one we're having next week, so you're in luck. I better see you next week, Susan. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing. I, I think that uh, people like to see what wines out there are ones that just go down easy and even better if they're cheap or we'll say less expensive. So um, now what um, we're actually gonna show you is what makes a crowd pleaser and we're gonna do it the fun way, which is through experience. We're actually we're gonna dive right into tasting these wines um, so that you can actually taste what does or does not make a crowd pleaser. So we're gonna start tasting right away, and we're gonna start from the beginning. So we're gonna engage our sense of sight, right? We start with our eyes. And I want you to remember what we talked about last week, which is keep it simple, or KISS, K-I-S, keep it simple. And so when we look at this wine, red, white, or rosé? I know, that's easy, okay, okay. Um, but what you can do is go further if you want, and you guys can tell me what you think. Um, you can say it's more of a ruby color, or perhaps purple or you could talk about it being tawny or having some brown to it. So if you think uh, you wanna go further with uh, the color, go ahead and tell us what you think, whether you think it's purple, ruby, or uh, maybe a, a garnet color, okay? And um, let's get to the nose. Uh, go ahead and give it a swirl. Remember, kissing is for everyone. So K-I-S, kissing, keeping it simple is for everyone. So this will lead us to wine IQ number two. So what do you smell? There are no right and wrong answers on this one, so don't worry. Uh, just, but what do you smell on this one? Keep it simple. Kiss, right? Start with fruit, earth, and spice. I'm seeing pe some people talk about the color, ruby, purple, definitely, guys, in that um, end of the spectrum. Definitely some purple hues. If you look at the rim of this wine, you get almost some blues in there. You know, blue and red makes purple, so we get a little of that purple color. So I see, uh, we see some black fruit. Some dark fruit. Any anything, Skip? You see? Other than so far, everybody's just talking about color. Everyone's talking about color. Okay. That we because we, we have a thirty second lag on the social stream, so we'll, we'll wait for you guys. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing a lot of fruit. Lots and lots of fruit. Spice. Spice. We get some spice as well. Okay. But it's interesting because when we talk about a crowd pleaser. Probably the number one thing you want to look for in your wine is fruit. I mean, who doesn't like fruit? I mean, who, who actually hates an apple? I, if you hate an apple, let me know. I would love to know if anyone hates an apple. I mean, some people might like some fruit other than other fruits, but you know, people don't hate fruit. I mean, if I gave you uh, um, some apples and then I gave you some dirt or earth in the other hand, which one are you going to want to eat? the apples, right? Although, you know, sometimes we like to have a little dirt in our wine, it, it adds complexity, but for crowd pleasers, if you want it to resonate with lots of people, what you're looking for is fruit, okay? Uh, Skip, do you have something? Here's, here's one to think about. Uh, Lavender Blue Susie says, smelled smoky and bacon, then chocolate. 
Okay, we got lavender, smoky, uh, bacon. bacon. Love it, love it. Yeah, because what we what we've started is simple, so fruit. And then I saw a lot of people going to that next level, saying to themselves, "Hmm, is it uh, dark fruit or red fruit?" And that's really great, guys, because what that's doing is you're using the power of suggestion to get you perhaps to a more specific smell. So, like I said, kissing is for everyone. K I S, keeping it simple. It's for wine newbies because. That way, uh, it doesn't get complicated and you have fun with it. You don't, you don't feel pressured to do anything. And so you can say fruit and be done. But kissing, K-I-S, is also for wine gurus. And that's because what it's going to do is provide that power of self-suggestion. So we talked about fruit, black or red. A lot of people are saying black. I agree. Then um, we got into, I also think, you know, dark plums and blackberries. And then um, someone probably said to themselves, oh, okay, I, I smell a little spice. Now is it pungent like pepper like black pepper or is it like a sweet spice or maybe it's like dark chocolate or bacon yeah i love it okay and then um perhaps earth yeah definitely uh, you know what kind of earth is it a floral earth or is it a a dirty earth you know i get um some of that smokiness but also i get the floral quality as well and then i might say what kind of flowers is it white yellow or purple and uh this is more of a purple flower and then I might say, oh, it's very violet-like. So you can see how that uh, progression will be good, not only for wine newbies, for wine gurus as well. Anything else, uh, Skip, people are saying about the wine and what they smell on this one? Well, earthy dark fruit, and one person mentions lots of alcohol. Okay, great. Okay, so earthy dark fruit, and someone mentioned a lots of alcohol. Also, what I'm seeing is black cherry, cloves, nutmeg, violet, oak. You guys rock. What this... I love this forum right now because what we've done is we've taken all of our palettes and put them into the same virtual room and now we're helping suggest aromas to other people. And what that does is it opens up the pathways to recognize more and so you're all helping each other become better tasters. So, and, and if you don't get something that someone else smells, that's totally cool too because everyone has a different palette, you have different levels of sensitivity and you also have different experiences. Let's say BG Dub, he mentioned uh, nutmeg. You know, maybe he loves eggnog, right? And so he's really good with nutmeg. And so, and um, you've never had an eggnog in your life, so you don't even know what nutmeg smells like. How are you gonna identify it? So just um, take it till it's fun, and then if it becomes something it's not, then just leave it at what you're at. Um, she does love eggnog. <laughs> See? See, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you, wine tasting doesn't only help improve your tasting experiences of wine, but I really think that it helps you better appreciate your food as well. You'll see, the more and more you wine taste, the more and more your, your nose and your palate start to tune into your food. So we'll save that for another wine cast, but it's something to, to think about, okay? So let's see, so fruit, we mentioned, where am I, oh, the fruit, okay, the fruit is very important in a crowd pleaser. Now for the next point, let's go to the palate, you're like, finally, my goodness, this girl, she keeps talking about the nose, that's actually, my mom would not be happy with me right now, so everyone take a sip, um, so that, that, I, that my mom is happy, okay, I mean really, what do we really aspire to do in life, is make our mothers happy, right, right Scoop? Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to the palette. Um, now this leads us to uh, wine IQ number three. And what I want you to focus on is the level of tannin. So go ahead and take a sip. I will too, I'll join you guys. Um, okay, now as you're um, thinking about that, I, <laughs> sorry, I just saw what you wrote, Skip. Yeah, I think everyone's passed the first sip as well. So, um, what I want to tell you while you're thinking about the tannins is how to feel and judge tannins. First, what are they? Tannins are molecules that provide structure for plant matter. And so, um, uh, well, let's look at a grape, for instance. A grape, you find the tannins in the skin, only in the skin, really, and also the, the stems as well. If you look at the skins in the stem, they have a de defined shape, a definite shape. And that, that molecule, the, the tannin molecule, helps with that. Whereas if you look at the juice on the inside, it's, it's not, doesn't have any shape. It doesn't have, or not any, but it has little shape. And so tannin provides structure. Other places where you may have tried tannin is in something like coffee. So if you have a cup of joe and it's, it's black, uh, no cream or sugar, after you take a sip, you're gonna have a bit of a, a rough feeling in your mouth. 
And that's because tannin molecules tend to bind with protein molecules. And your saliva qualifies as a protein molecule. So when you swallow that wine, that tannin drags all that, um, that saliva down with it and leaves your mouth dry. Now where you're going to feel it in your mouth are going to be on your tongue and your gums. Those are where you're going to feel it. And if it's low in tannin, you're not going to have much of a drying sensation. Um, it's not going to taste much different than, say, a white wine in terms of that textural uh, difference. On the other hand, if you tend to have, um, you can almost feel something on your gums or your tongue and it's like sandpaper-like and drying, and if it's really extreme, then it's in high. Anywhere in between is really medium. And, and it, It'll be, um, I think a lot of people think, well, everything's medium. Well, it's not everything's medium, but a lot of wines are medium because of the definition of medium. Medium is average or what's normal or, uh, you know, in the middle. So um, most of our wines are going to be in the medium range. And um, let's see, I get a lot of medium, medium, medium. Good. Uh, do you see anything else besides for medium? Uh, one low. One low? Okay. I would, you guys are right on, because I would say medium, but if I were to go any direction, it would not be to high, it would actually be to the low direction. So great, you guys are um, spot on. So what is, why, why am I bringing this up? I'm not trying to say that a crowd pleaser is either high or low in tannins. What I'm trying to say is that it has to, it has to fit into the wine. So let's um, take my, um, my uh, makeshift scale. This is my scale, okay? It's, it's, it's balanced right now. And on this wine, Skip is actually looking for my balance. Skip, it's just on the screen. I see it now. Okay. Um, so anyways, back to, back to business. Okay, so um, this wine is dry. I'm going to take a sip. But it also has medium acid, okay? And it also has what we call medium body. Now, we layer in what you guys just told me, which is medium tannin. And it becomes a little easier to see that this wine has what we call balance, right? They're all medium, and that works. Now that said, so that's our second um, thing we look for in a crowd pleaser is balance. So how I would describe balance is a um, wine in which no, no one component of the wine is remarkable. What I mean by that is that you want to have, oh, it, it, and why I say is remarkable is it, they don't all have to be medium. It just all has to be, it has to be cohesive. It has to come together well. And in fact, I think components can stand out, but if they're cohesive and not remarkable, then I think uh, you have a, a balanced wine. And the more wine you taste and actually think about what balance is, the more you're going to understand uh, this concept. Um, so how does this how does this relate to crowd pleasers? Well, um, actually, you know, before before we go on to that into that vein, let me actually digress for a second, because this particular wine, like I said before, is one of my favorites. Now, on Monday, just to make sure that this wine was okay for you guys, I opened a bottle, which is over here. Okay, it's gone. Um, but I opened it, uh, and uh, this is the first time I tried this particular vintage, which was 2009, and I actually. I, I still like it, but it was a little less balanced than what I had seen in the previous vintages. And what I want you to focus on when you take a sip, and someone already remarked on it on nose, is the alcohol. So I want you to take a, a sniff and a, and a taste again and think about the alcohol, whether the alcohol is on the high side or the low side. Okay, and we'll see what you have to say. Now, when I first tasted it, I panicked. I was like, I'm looking for a balanced wine, and I, you know, this one isn't as balanced as I thought. But what I thought is this, um, you know, uh, as I uh, recovered from my panicking, I thought this is actually a really good lesson um, in what balance is and what it is not as well. So um, I think, let's see, is uh, anyone commenting on the alcohol? Yep. We've got one saying medium or higher alcohol, hot. Mm -hmm, a little hot, yep. And um, so Susan did get a little bit of a high. And BG Dub, what you said, you said the alcohol seems to blow off a bit. Again, spot on. I am um, gonna um, comment on that in just a second. So, but when you f if you just opened it, when it um, comes into the glass, the alcohol is a little high. Now, because I was caught off guard with that on Monday, I thought, what is going on? You know, this what I value about this wine is how much balance it has compared to the other Malbecs from Argentina. Uh, all the other Malbecs from Argentina tend to have this this uh, really overripe uh, nose and palate, along with this high alcohol. 
Whereas this one tends to have some restraint and some balance that I don't see in the other ones. So I actually, uh, you know, checked out the vintage to see what was going on. And they claim that this one, this vintage, 2009, was a spectacular vintage. Meaning for them, it was ex extremely hot and dry. Now, if we're in an area that is already extremely hot, and we're valuing a wine for its restraint and ability to stay cool. We talked about that, the high altitude and the remolinos or the whirlwinds. An especially hot vintage, I might be off here, but especially hot vintage actually doesn't seem to be such a positive thing for this particular producer. And you can taste it on the wine. I'm sure the alcohol isn't much higher than it is in previous vintages, but it's remarkable. People are remarking on it. And so it lost a little bit of its balance. Um, I will say the previous three or four vintages um, were more well balanced. Now this one, I think it's because when you have a winemaker and it's the uh, only the fourth vintage, I don't care how many vintages they've done in other places, when it's the first time they're working with that vineyard, an anomaly vintage throws you a curveball. So perhaps there was a, a little less understanding on um, uh, the alcohol effects, I don't know. So I'm not, I'm not a winemaker, I'm not going to get too much into it, but I did notice it and I thought it was a good lesson to see, show you that there is a little bit of an off balance here, for a little bit. And BG Dub, you, you, you hit on it, um, uh, meaning it blows off. And that's the thing is, keep this wine open, not only tonight, but try to save it for tomorrow. I uh, tried the wine the next day and it was so much better um, in terms of balance. I already think it's a good wine, but in terms of balance, that alcohol really blew off. And even after 20, 30 minutes or go back to it in an hour, not only does the alcohol blow off, but you tend to get uh, even more aromas and complexity on the nose. Um, so that is two of the things that we look for, fruit and balance. Now this third thing that we look for, before we go on, Skip, anything remarkable? Well, you've got BG Dub saying, uh, giving you some specifics here, saying that sometimes the vanilla characteristic of Malbecs seem to really throw the balance off. Mm -hmm. but, but I do think this is a fairly balanced Malbec. So BG Dub thinks this is a fairly balanced? Good, yeah. Okay. And you're also being asked by Susan, uh, why did it lose its balance? Too much grain? What are the factors? So, great. So Susan asked, you know, why did it lose its balance? Like I said, this is already a hot vintage. And so when you have an especially hot and dry vintage, now we're struggling even more to keep it cool. And so one place we see the effects of really hot and dry weather is gonna be on the alcohol. Because what happens on the vine? The sugar spike with hot and dry, as long as it's not too hot. If it gets too hot in like 2003 in, in, in France, you're gonna have vines shutting down. But if it's not too hot, then the, the sugars are just gonna spike. Sugars, if you wanna dry wine, are gonna have to become alcohol, okay? So that that's why, Finding balance on the vine is so important because it's going to translate into the glass. And in fact, it's going to be amplified in the glass if anything was out of balance. Okay, for the, in the interest of time, we're going to go on. We're almost at, uh, we're almost at 30 minutes, but good thing we're on our third um, crowd-pleasing uh, attribute, and that's length. So what's length? Length is how long the wine lasts, the, the, I'm sorry, the flavor lasts in your mouth after you swallow. So go ahead and take another sip. And what I want you to think about is how long the flavor lasts. Now on a crowd pleaser, it doesn't have to be a long finish. Uh, it just has to have a clean and pleasant finish. So what has to happen? Well, the flavor has to be longer than any bitter element in the wine. If you have a bitter element in the wine, that's actually the last thing we taste on a wine. Uh, it usually takes about one to two seconds for us to register bitterness, and then it can take up to 10 seconds for it to peak. So if you do have bitterness in your wine, you have to make sure the flavor lasts longer. So if you have no bitterness, your length can be short, but you're going to have a nice, clean finish, and it's a crowd pleaser. Or you might have a little bitterness, but you have a long length, and uh, you'll end up with a, um, a length that's longer than the bitterness in the wine. So these are the three things that I think make a crowd pleaser. In addition to, to those three, I'll, I'll give like an honorable mention to uh, mouthfeel, which this definitely has. Mouthfeel is really important for a lot of people. And this has that soft, velvety texture um, that, that really appeals to people. Sometimes more than smells and tastes is just how it feels in your mouth. 
So let's see. What do you actually? What did you guys think about the length? Um, go ahead and comment on that if you want. If you thought it was clean, pleasant, short, long, whatever descriptor, whatever descriptor you want to use on that, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, let us know. Um, and um, to wrap up, I always like to wrap up with what did you think about the wine? So uh, I'll explain if I could get my. There we go. <laughs> When I'm the speaker and the producer and the thing and the thing and the thing, it, sometimes um, things happen a little slower. So what do you think? Dump it means it's not even good enough to finish the glass. You just go throw it away. Finish it. It's good, but you're just, um, you're not going to go out and buy another bottle when there's so many good bottles of wine out there. Uh, buy it. It's good enough that you're willing to um, buy some more of this wine. Stock it. It's so good you're going to hold on to it. I'm not hold on to it. I'm sorry. You're going to stock it in your house so that you've got it for when people come over and so you can have it any night of the week. And then save it is for wines that um, perhaps maybe are a little bit more expensive, but you'd buy it or even stock it or they need some time in the bottle. So you just you kind of want to hold on to it for a little bit. And the idea of these, these uh, um, judgment calls is that Instead of ratings, which what do you do with a rating? These are hopefully action steps which will allow you to convert your knowledge from, say, these tastings into, into action steps. So what do people have to say out there? Let's see. Um, oh, should we talk about finish first? I see people saying definitely clean and pleasant finish, medium plus uh, finish, good. Yeah, I said medium finish. So, um, and uh, um, you get, and the longer it sits in your glass, the more that alcohol blows off and the smoother the finish is. So, um, okay, so buy it for the holidays. Definitely um, finish it and buy it, good. Stock it, love to see what age does to it. And that's a, that's a Brian O'Keefe, that's a great, um, a great comment is that Malbecs are a great wine at a lower price that sometimes sometimes have the capability of aging and you don't have to spend as much as you would spend say in a region that's more expensive like Bordeaux. Great well I'll tell you a little anything else Skip that, that I didn't cover? Well you've got one, one person saying finish it and if they don't think that alcohol was a problem and okay. you can do better for the price. So, okay, so someone mentioned um, they uh, could do, maybe do a little better for the price. Yeah, this one comes at just around 20 bucks, so it's not a cheap wine by any means. Now, I really waffled on this one. And I was like, at first, right at my immediate t uh, tasting after, um, on Monday, I was like, oh, I'd finish it. But with that alcohol, I wasn't sure. And then um, if you would have asked me like last year for last vintage, I would have said for sure stock it. Um, so, but this year I'm actually, for this vintage, I'm saying buy it. And you know why though? Because this wine I had the next night and it was fantastic. It actually I thought was better the next day. And what better wine to have at home than a wine that you open and have a glass on a Monday, like I did. And then, and maybe your husband has a glass too. And then you open it on Tuesday and you both get another glass. And so we mentioned, or someone, who mentioned the higher price? Um, uh, Rish, Rish Leshy. I don't know. Okay, yeah. Rish Leshy. Rish Leshy. <laughs> I don't know. Mentioned a higher price. Now, the only thing I would say to you is that if you do use it over two nights, you can amortize the cost over two nights. So, so then it becomes a $10 bottle of wine, so not so expensive. But, um, but I definitely get it. It's a little bit more expensive. Um, but I would say buy it. I think it's um, a really solid wine. Um, uh, um, when the alcohol blows off a little, you get more of the crowd-pleasing aspects. And I think that might be it. Um, but before we uh, take any uh, additional questions, I just want to do a little housekeeping things before we lose people. Um, if you want to join us next week, we're going to be doing Terry K. So Susan, I saw you already got the wine. So Terry K. Um, is going to be next week, and we're going to use that to talk about white wine making. I actually was able to visit this winery in southwestern France, and they were well ahead of their time in terms of white wine making. So I thought it would be a great wine to show you how they make white wine and how they do it so well and keep it fairly inexpensive. And if you're looking where to get the wine, go here. There's a link to show you how to get the wine. Also, if you're looking next time you want to chat and interact more, go there too. And that will give you a, uh, a link to a tutorial for how to chat. Um, and then also there's a survey there too. 
if you were here last week, you might notice things are a little different. I changed the tree. I changed my hair. I mean, I'm listening. So um, definitely let me know what you think. Uh, you have the ability to shape what we're doing here, and it's very exciting, I think. Um, so I'd love for you to be even more involved. So even if you did the survey last week and you want to comment on something, go ahead um, and you can take the survey from October. It says October 5th. You can just take that survey again. Um, and uh, we really will value your comments. So I really appreciate it. How, 35, okay, I'm a little over. Well, we got a lot of interaction. We're trying to work on the interaction. Um, so any, uh, are there any other questions? Otherwise, we're just gonna sign off and I can answer the, uh, um, someone's telling me to drink. Yeah. You know who that is? It's my sister. I told you, it yeah. runs in the family, okay? My mom tells me to drink and my sister tells me to drink. Jenny, I'll drink, okay? Happy now? <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're going to sign off. I'll answer any unanswered questions uh, on that uh, MW dec decant. So go ahead and check that out. While um, we're signing off, let's just uh, transport ourselves into Argentina. This is actually the winery at Desero. And um, thanks so much for joining us for Crowd Pleasers. I'm Jessica Bell uh, from My Wine School, and this is Wine Your Way. Good night.